Let's be honest, last week's episode of NXT nearly did my nut in. So how do they follow up on that? How do they follow up on that? Especially when next week AEW presents Lame of Thrones. They, uh, they just keep kicking ass. Let's talk about it. What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pals, Pass Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check, here with your November 25th NXT review, and yes, to my American friends, happy Thanksgiving week, weekend, Black Friday, whatever you want to say. Oh, I probably shouldn't say Black Friday, that'll probably eventually get me cancelled, but to all of you that are celebrating this week, this weekend, etc, 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 as well as we can in the current global bastard, I wish you, uh... I wish you all the celebrations you can possibly have, as many as I had back in the Canadian Thanksgiving, I mean, the, the proper Thanksgiving, but that's, it is what it is. Before, before I get into the typical house cleaning, I want to send a quick, or not not send a quick shout out, but I want to give you guys a quick recommendation. I don't always listen to the Lillian Garcia Chasing Glory podcast, but I did, I did listen to it today because they did, she was interviewing Shotzi Blackheart, and you guys know I love Shotzi Blackheart, I love Shotzi Blackheart since she came and performed here at Destiny, yes, check that off your Spaz Phoenix bucket list. Um, I already thought she was great, I had heard bits and pieces that she had had a bit of a rough life, uh, I had no idea, I really do suggest you guys go and, uh, and check it out, uh, I'm not making any jokes here, I'm not making anything, uh, it is what it is, and you know, everybody you know, supports who they support, but it is a really good interview. Uh, as I say, Lillian Garcia is not my favorite podcaster, I'm not gonna lie. Great announcer, great singer, uh, podcast is, is a little eh for me. This one was really good, a uh, lot, lot of good insight on Shotzi, and if you're anything like me and you lo love what she's doing in NXT or you've seen her anywhere else and you love what she's done anywhere else, I really do suggest it. It is, it's, it's a hell of a listen, uh, I'll say that. Um, as far as house cleaning goes, uh, like I said, American Holiday this week, uh, I didn't take that into consideration when I had planned to do part two of the NXT Women's Division Breakdown with Jake DeMarco, so we are going on pause this week a little bit. Uh, there won't be anything going up this Friday because I didn't have anything else planned. Uh, quite frankly, I, I'm going to be hitting up Guapo to do some stuff as well, but again, the same, uh, the same issue applies. I'm the only... Uh, yeah... Every single person who has co-hosted with me on this channel, with the exception of James, shout out to James, what's up, buddy, uh, is American. So I would, I would always be, I would always be slave to the American holidays, wouldn't I? Um, once again, to all my amazing co-hosts, I hope you guys are having an amazing holiday, as well, you know, as much as we can in the current global bastard. Um, so there won't be anything this coming Friday. What there was two days ago, though, is the finally the chapter two of the Joker trilogy that Kristen and I are doing on the in the Flix Fix series. It is long. We did spend a lot of time. It's a long podcast talking about a long movie, and I don't think uh, I don't think we came out of it particularly positive. Not because it's a bad movie, but because the things that happen in the movie aren't positive. What it says about society, etc., etc., etc. It is quite long. It is over two hours. Uh, for those of you that did come and hang out with us live on the chat, cool. Thank you very much. For those of you that went back and saw the replay or checked it out uh, in podcast form, thank you for that. We will be doing the uh, the other eventually. I am kicking around, as I said last week, the idea of reviewing uh, WandaVision uh, on Disney Plus when it comes around in uh, in January. Like I said last week, I do encourage you guys to go check out our uh, our friend OK Fabe, who is currently reviewing The Mandalorian. Uh, you guys know I like Star Wars. I like Marvel better. If I'm going to do something, it's going to be WandaVision. Um, so yeah, so no, no me and Jake, no me and, and Guapo uh, this week. So Friday after SmackDown, you're free. You can do whatever you like, which you probably do. Anyways, moving on. Uh, obviously, next Thursday, uh, going out next Friday, will be myself and Jake DeMarco previewing NXT TakeOver War Games, and that's going to be a hell of a show. Um, I am... I took the shot at the beginning at AEW because it's right there and it's so goddamn easy. I am intrigued by uh, by their what is I keep on calling it Lame of Thrones, so I forget what the actual name of it is. Is, is it like uh, the coming winter or some shit like that? 
I am intrigued by some stuff on that show. Uh, I will give it a look. If I end up doing any kind of content on it, it will be a couple days after after the event because obviously I do NXT. You guys know the you guys know the drill. I watch NXT. I record this, and literally while I'm editing this, while I was editing this video you're watching or this podcast you're listening to right now, guarantee I had AEW on in the background while I was doing it. Um, but I but I can't take the piss too much. Kenny Omega versus John Moxley is, is gonna be is gonna be good. Some of the other stuff, I mean, Cody's gonna fight Shaq, isn't he? And that weird man chick is gonna get involved somehow and. Randy Rhodes is going to show what a ring rat she is, and that's going to be that. So, with that statement right there that's going to make me super popular, let's slip into the socials for a second. Go follow me on Twitter, at SpazPhoenix, and at SpazPhoenix1. Go find me on Instagram, at SpazPhoenix. Go to Facebook, look up the Spaz Phoenix Podcast Facebook group. If you're watching me right now with the pretty sexy face and the gimmick hat, you want to find me in an audio form, go to Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, etc., etc., etc. Look for Spaz Phoenix Podcast. If you are listening to me right now, and you don't see the pretty sexy face, and you don't see the gimmick hat, go to YouTube, search Spaz Phoenix. It really is that easy. I am on this channel, as I've been grilling for a couple of months now, getting ever closer to the small, simple goal that I have left for myself of reaching uh, 1,100 subs by December. It would be a nice Christmas present for me. It would be a nice birthday present for me, which is three days before Christmas, if you're wondering. Uh, it would be an okay... Uh, cheer me up type thing be t to end off this shitty shitty year we are having uh but yeah 1100 uh i think i'm about 30 away right now so if that happens that'd be cool if not it is what it is we'll we'll rock into the new year and that'll be that going into this week's show now that i've rambled for nearly seven minutes look at the timer look at the timer on your youtube look at the timer on whatever podcast platform i've already been rambling for seven minutes and we haven't even gotten into the show yet this week was pretty cool. Kevin Owens on commentary because uh, Wade Barrett wasn't there, and that added to the show in more ways than one. As we'll get to, we got a recap of last week. Finn Balor coming out to make his announcement, being interrupted by the Undisputed Era, who were interrupted by the Kings of NXT. And uh, the announce. I love the fact that William Regal's literal announcement of any war games has become its own thing. If I think about it, I'm probably going to grab that sound clip and make it the intro when uh, when Jake and I talk about the pay-per-view. Um, it's it's weird though because you get the, you get the the conversation online about you know you want to be surprised versus you want to be predictable this that and the next thing this is predictable because we saw it building but like when you see something building and they're telling a story don't you want to see that payoff uh jake and i in one of our one of our videos i don't remember which one it was it may have been it may have been the preview for halloween havoc uh we had a conversation about like how much do you really want to know going into a show and i mean a weekly show not a not a pay-per-view obviously and um People these days, because there are people like me, people in the podcast community, people in the YouTube community, people on the dirt sheet community, and they want to know everything that's going to happen because they're doing content on it. Now, I, t I try to take my mind out of out of that so much and uh, think if I was just, if I wasn't doing this, if I wasn't looking you guys in the camera right now, if I wasn't talking into your ear holes in a podcast, would I want to know what's going on in the show? Honestly, maybe give me one match. Maybe give me one match or or a little bit of a story thing, but I don't want to know everything that's happening on the show. The and this isn't a dig. Everybody likes things their own way, and some some people like the the uh, the uh, the knowledge of what's coming their way. I don't really like the way that Dynamite uh, towards the end of their show they give you a flashcard, a flashcard, a flashcard, a flashcard. Here's everything that's going to happen next week. I would love a couple surprises, and I tell you. We had a couple surprises on this show tonight that we're going to talk about. We started off hot with Candice LeRae, obviously Indy Hartwell in her corner, taking on Ember Moon. Cheap shot from Ember Moon to Indy to start the match, just to set the pace. Moon uh, pins LeRae to the ropes, and LeRae hides in the ropes, because that's what you do, ride out the rules, etc. She does a little bit of a cat and mouse thing uh, in the ropes to start off the match. Drop kick by... Sorry, my writing sucks. Already, early, early, early in the episode, we're already talking about how much my writing sucks. Moon drop kicks Lorray into Indy, 
Uh, second drop kick by Moon, wheelbarrow face buster on the desk on the outside, deep fall away slam by Moon, LeRae tries to leave, she goes up the rampway, Moon grabs her as she reaches the stage and boots her all the way back down to the ring, boots by LeRae, LeRae works the back, both trade some body shots, there's a neck vice by LeRae and a long pinning reversal sequence to follow, uh, spin kick by Moon, a running forearm by LeRae, they, um, Back elbows by Moon and a hair takedown by LeRae, which was really nice. Cradle suplex by Moon, and it was sort of like a trap cradle, and it was it was it looked. I mean, everything in wrestling looks like it hurts. Don't get me wrong, but this looks like it. It almost had a, a muscle buster feel to it. it I and mean, she didn't take her off the top rope or anything like that. But other than that, the way she trapped her, the way she cradled her tight into the suplex, it had echoes of the muscle buster i'll say that much kai and gonzalez show up on the ramp the four heels sort of rally together outside the ring as we go into the commercial break as we come back from the commercial break there's a rear naked choke by larea head scissor into the gargano now now the tilt world head scissor into the gargano escape is a nice little sequence there isn't it larea turns it into a backpack sleeper uh backdrop by moon a series of kicks by moon ends in an insiguri the heels distract uh, Indy Hartwell gets in the ring and she eats the eclipse. She takes the bullet for her new mentor, but A, what does that do? It also acts as a distraction. Super kick, wicked stepsister, and the win for LeRae. Now, the four heels. Now, this is, you, you just, it's so good. It's nice when a plan comes together. Isn't that the expression? The four heels. You got Candice LeRae, Indy Hartwell, uh, you got Dakota Kai and you got Raquel Gonzalez out there, and they all, all four of them, just chuck Amber Moon out of the ring. And then Tony, uh, Tony Storm comes out to join Amber Moon, and you figure they were partners, they, they've helped each other, they've had similar problems with similar people and all that sort of thing. Tony joins her, they're gonna go back into the thing, they're gonna, you know, once more into the breach, two on four, who cares, let's get them, except Tony Storm turns on Ember Moon and chucks her into the steps and feeds her to the heels to a four-on-one beatdown. <laughs> now this is, I, I didn't expect this, I'm not gonna lie. Um, they had to do something because Tony Storm, I love Tony Storm, you guys, you guys know this, I sort of mutually fell in love with Rhea Ripley and Tony Storm at the same time in the Mae Young Classic and then watching them grow and have their rivalry on NXT UK. The problem was they brought over Rhea Ripley first and she got fucking over once she came over to the States. And she was so over that Tony Storm coming over to challenge her was going to be received badly even though I think she was supposed to be the good guy at the time. I wasn't expecting this. This was really good. I said... Last week, how many times last week did I say, Tony Storm, Rhea Ripley, Ember Moon, Shotzi Blackheart, there's your superstar team. I was comparing it to the uh, DX Hardy CM Punk Survivor Series team, wasn't I? But that's not going to happen now, because we've had this little wrinkle in the plan. Also, Indy Hartwell took the Eclipse like a fucking boss, and also, also, I don't care how bad this makes me sound, I would shag every single bit of Ember Moon. Would I not? Oh, yes. In the back, we see Undisputed Era showing up to BCWC. We get a, we get a promo in the back, pre-taped promo by Legato Del Fantasma. Nothing really new. They just um, go through their plans once again, and it's all very hoity-toity. It's all very gangster in... in not with, with with an R, not with an A, if you get my idea. Um, you know, they're all sitting back in their nice clothes and they're having their scotch and they're toasting the title and all that sort of thing. They talked about recreating Lucha Libre in their image. They talked about uh, recreating the Cruiserweight division in their image, how they've helped 205 Live, how they finally got the Cruiserweight title on a takeover, which is something Jake and I were saying forever in our previews, which is awesome. I'm glad that they realized that. Um... The fact that they've taken out Atlas, they've taken out Adonis, nobody's seen Swerve in a while, and there's this new guy, and I must have missed this? Somebody put it down in the box below, because I don't know who this is. Somebody by the name of Kurt Stallion it wants to challenge Legato, apparently. Um, basically, they say, you know, when we say something's going to get done, it gets done, and it's nice and simple, and they weren't calling anybody out, it wasn't leading to anything else, it was just you know, this heel faction, who are finding a lot of success right now, talking some shit. Oh yes, Undisputed Era come out. Basically, after, on the heels of their return last week, basically Adam Cole grabbing the microphone and saying, do we look dead to you? They said they killed us. They've been saying for weeks that they killed us. Do we look dead to you? How many people say this? How many people have tried to take us out? How many people said they did take us out? 
How many people say that, oh, Undisputed Era is gone, and now now it's our show? You gave us a bit of our own medicine, that's great. Pat's not even here tonight because he's a coward. There's a, you know, we're all going to get together in a couple weeks, and we're all going to be in War Games. It's the match that the Undisputed Era made famous. I love, I love that even though the transition from heel to face ha has occurred, we're still in the narrative that War Games is Undisputed Era's match because they've been in every single one. I don't think... Did they win one? I don't remember. This is going to be where they win one, I'm sure. It was lots of fun to beat up on Pat and his goons last week, and tonight there's a ladder match to um, establish the, the War Games advantage. Uh, right in the middle of his promo, Kyle steps up and he says, like, look, after... Because they had already named Pete Dunne as the representative on the other side. Kyle steps up and he basically says, you know, after what happened a couple weeks ago, I I need to do this. You guys need to let me get in there and kick the shit out of Pete Dunne. Um, Adam just throws him all kinds of support, just like he did around his, his title shot. And immediately gets a little bit more serious and starts hyping up this new, better, you know, new and improved, angry Kyle O'Reilly, you know. It's, it's different now. Undisputed Era, we fought for titles before, we fought for bragging rights before, now we're going to fight at war games to prove who we are, and I think that's fucking wonderful. Lorray, in the back, introduces her team, and this is where this is where the turning of the screw happens. This is where the story gets more and more interesting, or so I thought. It's not as exciting as I thought it was, but we're going to go with it. Uh, she introduces her team. Her team is herself, uh, Kai and Gonzalez. Tony Storm, there's your four, which leaves out Indy Hartwell, and Indy Hartwell's not even there for the uh, interview, and at the time, you don't even really know why, but um, it is an interesting story, because you figured it was going to be those two pairings, it was going to be Kai and Gonzalez, and Candice LeRae, and Indy Hartwell, now, whether this is because Indy Hartwell, like, joined NXT five minutes ago, I don't know. Uh, is it because Tony Storm's a bigger star than Indy Hartwell? With all due respect to Indy Hartwell, probably, and prob and couple that with what I said before, where Tony Storm really needs to do something different with her character if she's if she wants to uh, reach some success. Because as I say, I like her. It's not it's not hitting for for whatever reason. Uh, anyways, we're gonna get more into that story as we go along. Thatcher versus Kushida for reason. Maybe? Um, match is about to start. Champa comes down to the ramp with a chair. Thinks We think he's all gonna, he's gonna, you know, start some shit. Really, he just pops the chair down and he's gonna watch the match. Butterfly, locked by Thatcher to start the match, rolls into an armbar. Kushida, there's a lot of chain wrestling in here. And I didn't quite know how to take these notes, so you're gonna have to bear with me a little bit. Kushida reverses and uh, works the ankle. Series of kicks. Boots by Kushida. Both men trade some strikes. Belly to belly by Thatcher. Into a leg lace. Out of the belly to belly, which was really terrifying. I'm not going to lie. Indian Deathlock with a face lock by Kushida. Thatcher rev uh, reverses the neck vice and hits him with some uppercuts. Hip toss. Low drop kick by Kushida. And a hanging ankle lock over the top rope by Thatcher that just made Kushida look like a rag doll. And I don't mean a rag doll like he made him look stupid. It means he looked like he was in a lot of pain. Oh, yes. Mule kick and body shots by Kushida. They trade some uppercuts. A butterfly lock again by Thatcher to just take you right back to the beginning of the match. And then he uh, it's reversed into a Kimura by Kushida. Um, reversed to a grounded headlock by Thatcher. A boot by Kushida. Kimura by Thatcher. Because what? Because anything you can do, I can do better. You know I love that story. Cross arm breaker by Kushida. Ankle lock by Thatcher. That's countered by Kushida into an ankle lock of his own. Anything you can do, I can do better. Better. There's a pinning reversal sequence to follow. Kushida tosses Thatcher out. He's distracted by Ciampa. And then I, I blinked when this happened. But it was a mix of, wow, that was really dumb. But also, wow, that really looks like it hurt. Thatcher, on the outside, goes for an uppercut and ends up, I don't even, I can't even properly explain this to you, he uppercuts the ring post, which would have fucking wrecked, I'm just saying. Running punt kick to the air, or to the arm, because my writing sucks, by Kushida, hoverboard lock, and Kushida gets the submission win over the bigger, badder, scarier Timothy Thatcher. Champa looks right into the camera and says, well, maybe he has a problem with me now. Remember Champa came out last week and they asked why he fucked with Thatcher and he's like, because cause I want to fight Thatcher. Um, assuming, although it hasn't been announced just yet, that, um, you know, we're going to get that match at TakeOver. And you know what? 
we're, we're getting all kinds of weird shit. We're going to get into more in a second, and some of it that I'm not really a fan of. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of weird matches outside of the... Um, outside of the two actual War Games matches. So if these guys have some kind of street fight, I, it's not going to hurt my feelings at all. We see highlights from uh, Shirai versus Ripley last week, which was fucking insane. Apparently they had to do something to fix Ripley's ear after what happened. I, I don't know all the details, but it sounds pretty grisly. Uh, it's voiced over by the two of them and how they've earned this mutual respect, and then it sort of caps off with an ominous quote from Rhea Ripley. Well, where does Rhea Ripley go? From here, we're going to find out later on tonight. I will say there was a lot of talking on this show. And because it doesn't happen a whole lot, I don't mind it. You couldn't do a show like this all the time, I'll be fair. But if you're going to have talking, you might as well have a talk show. you got a talk show host on commentary in Kevin Owens. So, for the very first time, I think, on NXT, you've got the Kevin Owens show. And his guest is Leon Rough. Uh, but first of all, Kevin Owens comes in, talks about how he's always he's always uh, open to an invitation to come back to NXT. Last year at this time he was in War Games. This time he's a commentary guy. Uh, you know, next year he might be a referee. Next year he might be a timekeeper, etc., etc., etc. He introduces Leon Ruff, who talks about winning the North American title and what winning the North American title means. He wants to be a big, you know, happy, inspirational guy. Smiles for miles, you might say. Um, but Kevin tries to boost him up a little bit. He's like, y "You sound like a good dude, and I hear everything you're saying, and it all sounds great. But you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta hype it up. You gotta put some bass in your voice, or else those guys in the back aren't gonna take you seriously." He's, I, "I did it. I'm the champion. I can do anything." And then he, the the great thing about all this, I'm gonna try and explain what I mean here, and I'm I don't think I'm gonna do a good job. Why this worked is this is Kevin Owens doing the talk show gimmick while sequentially taking the piss out of the talk show gimmick because he says, you know, I, I, I this and that, and uh, I took out Gargano and, you know, Priest didn't take me seriously and right around, and he stops him because they're not even in the, the, the talk show chairs like they usually have on Raw SmackDown. They're just on, like, rolling desk chairs. So when he stands up, he sends the chair back and it hits one of the KO signs, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, it's because of the chair and all that sort of thing. And he says, you haven't been in WWE that long, but you can't really be on a show like that. You can't say somebody's name. If you say somebody's name, they come out. Look. And he just points at the rampway. And eventually Gargano comes out. Gargano comes out doing his, no, 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 you didn't really win. You know, you had to be helped by by a uh, priest and all that sort of thing. And Owens is great because just in the background of, of Gargano ranting, he's, he's reaching out of the ring. He's bringing another chair into the ring. <laughs> just puts it in the ring and Gargano's like I don't need a chair and he throws it out of the other side and then he just goes to the side gets another chair brings it into the ring he's like I don't need a chair he's like don't worry about it don't just trust me I'm gonna leave it over here it's not for you it's fine see you didn't know what what Ruff didn't know is you know you say somebody's name eventually they're gonna come out and he points the ring again or the rampway again and then it comes Priest and Priest comes out and talks some shit to Gargano which is fine puts over Leon Ruff but also he says you know you gotta watch it when you're being a tough guy you were trying to be a tough guy last week and you said you were gonna take on both of us and Kevin again offers him a chair he says you know hey man Priest would you like a chair? <laughs> Which is great. Because these guys are doing the promo. And Kevin Owens is like the hype man on the outside making the promo happen. He's like, hey man, like, appreciate it. No thanks, I don't need a chair or whatever. And then as the three of them go at it, um, you know, they make reference to Leon Ruff saying he was going to take on both of them at the same time. And roddy roddy ra. And Kevin Owens sits there and he says, ah, oh, if only we had Teddy Long here. But we don't have Teddy. Teddy Long doesn't work for the work for the company anymore. If only we had our own version of Teddy Long and points at the ramp again. Regal comes out to make the super obvious announcement that the three of them are going to fight in a triple threat match at War Games for the North American Championship. And then William Regal ends his little piece playa <laughs> and then he just leaves this was this shouldn't be uh, you you guys know i shoot the shit with jake while i'm watching this because he's watching aew to uh go and do all the cool shit that he does over on the joe cronin show talking about aew while i'm doing this and we sort of banter back and forth and i just said you got to watch the kevin owens show like it's not going to set the world on fire but this is 
like Kevin Owens knows exactly what he's doing. Like he's in it and he's watching it at the same time. And I don't think there's very many other people that can do what Kevin Owens did here because he didn't make himself the focus, but he was doing not commentary like you would have at the commentator's desk, but he was doing commentary on what he saw happening on his own, his own, you know, his show, his segment, whatever the case may be. This was way better than, than I'm saying it because you can't, you can't describe the the comedy of this because this again I don't think even I like Priest I like Gargano and I'm starting to like Leon Ruff not Leo Rush be very very careful people on Twitter get very upset if you get the two mixed up even though they're very very similar and have almost identical names moving on um, but he's making a name for himself as well which is awesome and uh, but the highlight of this segment wasn't the segment it was Kevin Owens sort of hovering around the segment, and if that's what he's going to do, he didn't really have any direct impact on the show for the rest of the night, spoiler alert, um, but this was just good, and it was, it was what NXT can do, uh, it's like when the Viking Raiders came back to have one more, more match in NXT, and, and Street Profits called them out for, like, having so many name changes since they went to the main roster, NXT is just off-center of WWE a bit that they can do shit like this, they can do the stuff that WWE does that drives us all crazy, but in doing it, also take the piss out of it, and I think that's fucking great, and you need... You need somebody like Kevin Owens to do that. Somebody who's sitting there in a t-shirt with a suit coat on and the bright, obnoxiously yellow tie on because he's in NXT and because WWE does colors. It's all fucking good. He had a... He was doing pre-show uh, pre interviews, I think, on Instagram. And he's sitting there with a mask and... Uh, what's his name? Nosferatu that's on commentary with him. I think... Uh, who is it? It's, it's Joe Cronin that calls him Nosferatu. I can't think of his real name now. But they're both in masks, and friggin', friggin' Kevin Owens has got a mask on from the office. And he doesn't say anything about it. It's just there. It's just right there in your face. The same with what he did here. Like, the chair stuff. Like, handing somebody a chair shouldn't be funny, but Kevin Owens makes it work. Jesus Christ, I hope... I really do hope that... Uh, I really do hope that they let him come back to NXT and have another run. I really hope, because, spoiler alert again, we still don't know who Balor's fighting at War Games, even though he's talking about it. I really hope we just get a one-off Balor versus Owens for, for the NXT title. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It doesn't have to be anything. Just let, Let's just go do it. Segue to uh, Balor in the back and... Uh, Mentions last mentions his own comeback last week. He said, "Oh, I set the table for so that those guys could go to war, but make sure you know whoever wins that war, don't make sure you don't put any checkers on my chessboard." I love that line. That's really good. Uh, he says, "But if you do want to step to me, I'm not hard to find. I work Wednesdays." <laughs> nice, simple promo throwing down the gauntlet to whoever wants to answer it. Uh, another one of those pre-tape Shotzi promos. She's still building her tank. You could just barely see the outline of the metal that she's like pretending to grind on, and it says TCB, which is what was on her tank. She's she's gonna come out in a huge tank, isn't she? Like her and her team are gonna come out on a huge tank at War Games, and it's gonna be fucking awesome. Um, didn't really say anything we didn't say last week because her promo talking to Candice also serves as the as the actual ad for the show, which is fine. Grimes and Atlas, I'm not gonna lie, I I like Atlas, Grimes is okay, I, I couldn't care, I really couldn't. Plus my stream died in the middle of this match, so Grimes wins with a cave-in, sucks for all the Atlas fans out there, because I know there are a lot of them, and I would love to see this guy succeed. I would love to see this guy maybe, you know, if not take out, um... Santos Escobar maybe have a have a feud with one of the other guys in Escobar's group because the other two guys aren't doing very much right now and when we get to the tag team situation later on I think they're going to be in the back um, sitting in the back seat when it comes to the tag team division as well um, bottom line Grimes wins with a cave in Loomis pops up at the side of the ring like he's fucking the fiend I don't I gave it a pass I really did uh, and here's where, you know, oh, Spaz likes everything on NXT. No, he doesn't. I don't like this. I gave this a pass at Halloween Havoc because it was a weird show, and Loomis is a weird gimmick, and 
Cameron Grimes playing weird final girl to Loomis for a for a horror themed show. It was something I was willing to take on. Plus, it was cinematic and it was fun. And they had the zombies, the zombie referee, which has gone on for way too long now. But Loomis pops up, and all of a sudden, all these videos come up around around the the CWC. I still can't get used to CWC, by the way. It still makes me think of Cruiserweight Classic. But around the CWC on the Trons, you see it's... And these videos are cutting between Grimes freaking out about stuff at various times and Loomis drawing pictures of him freaking out about stuff at various times. And then he reaches into his pocket and pulls out a strap and throws half of it to... to Grimes, and I'm just like, I don't... I don't want to see that match. I don't even want to see that match on Weekly NXT. But uh, Grimes tosses it back at him, and that's the end of the segment. Coming back from the commercial break, we get William Regal telling Grimes that not only does he have to have that strap match, that strap match is going to be a match at TakeOver. This, uh, this is not the move. Anyways, Ripley comes out, puts over Io Shirai, huge. He says, everybody, from my co-workers to the other people in the locker room to the fans on the on the internet is what's up for Rhea Ripley you know we saw that hug last week and it was a show of respect but I promise you it wasn't a send-off which is awesome because that just just about leans into you know when we see a match like that and everybody speculates on Twitter immediately oh that was a great send-off match she had I really hate that she's going to Raw or Smackdown she literally says it's not a send-off I'm here to stay I'm gonna get my way back to that title eventually and she's interrupted by Candice LeRae, and Candice LeRae comes out to the uh, to the stageway with Tony Storm, and my attention goes up. Oh yes, it does. Uh, she's mocking her for losing. She's like, "Oh, what are you gonna do? You're gonna come out here and tell us how you're gonna do better next time." Io stole that title from me twice. She got lucky twice. She beat you fair and square. You talk the talk, but I can actually walk the walk. And out come Gonzalez and Kai to join them. And Gonzalez has a beaten and limp Shirai over her shoulder, and they flop her down on the rampway. And then they go and beat up Rhea Ripley four on one with no help. So, what do we have? We have Candace, now Tony, Gonzalez, and Kai, and you've got on the other side an unconscious Io Shirai, a beaten down Rhea Ripley an Ember Moon that's been turned on, and Shotzi Blackheart, who is at the forefront of this entire fucking show, building herself a tank. This is going to be great. Now, this does solve another issue, because going into this star-studded women's uh, war games match, the other problem they did have was, okay, they're going to do the war games match, and who's Io Shirai going to fight? The answer is, she's not going to fight anybody singularly for her title she's probably going to be in the war games match now they didn't confirm that so as sure as i was last week with my predictions i am as sure this week and i'll probably be wrong on the go home show and that's fine then we get back into weird shit we see a car we see the back seat of a car and it's dark and like terrified shitting themselves boa and xia lee in the back and they get brought to this creepy warehouse and it seems like a really it seems like a really old, like, it. I, I don't even know what kind of movie. Like, uh, like t it seems like Taken, and it's got some of that vibe. And then obviously the random old dude shows up again, and they go in, and they see this robed figure, and, you know, they're apologizing, apologizing, apologizing with subtitles. The person under the robe obviously doesn't say anything, but the black, or the, uh, the black robed figure is just kind of sitting there, and the old guy does the thing with the ash on the hands again, and says, it's time, and they flash to the person in the robe, but all you see is the eyes. So I'm really curious now. I'm really, really curious now, but it's weird. It is more weird than I thought it was going to be, and I'm really okay with that, because it feels like they're going, like, WWE has done a lot of cinematic matches, obviously, in the uh, Global Bastard era, but it seems like they're going with an entirely cinematic story, with Regal having to go to Boa's house and find out where Xia Lee is, and if they experiment with an entirely cinematic storyline, I'm interested to see where that will go. I'm not saying it will be good. I'm not saying whatever type of match comes out of that is going to set the world on fire either. But it's it's 
I know they're doing a lot of really weird cinematic shit elsewhere. I know somebody got shot on Impact, and and Hornswoggle came out dressed as AJ Styles, which is terrifying, because a couple weeks ago on Dynamite, he was in a diaper hanging out with Jericho. Wrestling is weird. I'm going to let this be weird. It's fine. Ever-Rise are out there for a match, and they don't get a match. You know why they don't get a match? Because they get jumped from behind and absolutely owned. Because that's what Ever-Rise does. That's what Ever-Rise does. They are... They are the cogs. They are the other bodies in the ring while somebody else has a story. They did it for Drake and and Killian. Now they're doing it for the returning grizzled young veterans. Oh my god. This is going to be good. Uh, Zach Gibson and... Oh... Was it James Drake? I don't, I don't even know. Uh, Gibson cuts his, his typical promo. In case you've forgotten, we're back in NXT and soon to be NXT's number one. And the fact that he didn't say NXT UK's number one, it leads me to believe that he's actually, that they actually, it is James Drake, isn't it? Um, that they've actually transferred over, like Ripley actually transferred over, like Tony Storm actually transferred over, like Balor actually transferred over, and holy fuck am I okay with that. The only problem with that is, right now, if they are going for the NXT Tag Team titles, and obviously it's not going to happen at War Games, because the Tag Champions are involved in War Games, uh, right now that creates a heel versus heel dynamic, but Jesus Christ, if Drake and Gibson are taking on Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch at any given time, go back to any of the times that these four guys have interacted on NXT UK, and you know these guys are going to bitch slap the fuck out of each other, and I'm really excited. This is a... NXT still has, I mean, WWE as a whole, but specifically NXT has a long way to go with their tag team division, but this, for this brand... For this division within this brand, this is a big move, and I'm excited. And it didn't last very long. Like, they came in, they kicked the shit out of Ever-Rise, they did the soon-to-be, and and left. And there wasn't anything else done. Like, that's just, hey, by the way, we're back. That's that's cool. Uh, Candice LeRae is leaving. She's with Indy Hartwell, and Indy Hartwell is selling the Eclipse so well that she's in a neck brace. That's why she's not on the War Games team. That's cool, that's fine, that's whatever. Gargano catches up with them, says, hey, we're all going to win at War Games, and then they all get in the car. They all get in the car. Johnny, Candice, Indy, and Ghostface, dot, 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 question mark. I love it. I really, really do love it. You know what else I love? On a random weekly episode of NXT, and before you say that this is a, just a rating yet, let me per, let me remind you that next week on Lame of Thrones by AEW, you're, they're giving away Kenny Omega versus John Moxley. So keep that that that, that argument and just, just stick it back in your pocket. And maybe stitch the pocket shut. You'll be fine. Shh, it's okay. It's okay. Anyways, Kyle O'Reilly versus Pete Dunne in a ladder match for the War Games advantage. Four reasons. Uh, I love that if you uh, if you saw the what was it called Halloween Havoc, the the big ri risen up area where Shotzi Blackheart was doing her hosting from all night. In that area, they had two risen up pods, and on the risen up pods, in one pod you had. Um, What's... Ah, why are names escaping me? That's really terrible. Birch and Lorcan in one pod and the rest of Undisputed Era in the other pod. They're watching because Pat McAfee, as we all know, is a coward. He's at home. He even announced it on his show. So how could he possibly... How could you possibly doubt that? There's nothing... There's nothing going on whatsoever. It's fine. Um, trading some forums to start. There's a trip on the apron by Kyle, and we immediately go to commercial break. Don't like that. Especially when you got something cool like a ladder match. Don't like excessive commercials. They could have done... They could have gone to... Uh, USA and gotten the commercial free treatment for the 20 minutes that this match took up. Um, shot to the chest by Dunn as we come back from the commercial break. Running knee off the apron by Kyle. Dunn stomps both both of Kyle's hands in the ladder. Hits him with a super kick. Double leg and mounted punches by Kyle and uh, tosses him face first into the plexi. Dunn knocks the ladder f and... Uh, he, lo he knocks the ladder in such a way that it doesn't just like tip over like these. The whole ladder spins with Kyle 
on it. Uh, double arm breaker in the ladder by Dunn, and then he pins the hand under the ladder and steps on it, which is good because you the point the point of the thing. Anyways, um, Kyle walks on a leg lace on Pete Dunn as he's standing on the ladder so that the leg lace is through the rungs of the ladder. That's cool. Dunn stomps on the chest, dragon screw uh, in the ropes by Kyle. Inside out suplex on the bridge ladder by by Dunn is it just they almost fell too perfectly. It was almost video game esque, and I mean that in the most violent way possible. Because he takes them um, sort of inside out, so standing on the apron brings them up over the ropes through the through the. You guys know what I mean by by a ladder bridge. It's where they bridge the ladder between the apron and and the guardrail. Really, really, really nice, clean execution of a spot like that, if you can say that a, a move like that has been executed cleanly. Uh, Dunn sandwiches the hands in the ladder as we go to the commercial break. Kyle punches the chair that Dunn tries to use on him and hurts his hands some more. Uh, guillotine by Kyle, a sliding knee strike and a slam on the ladder. Knee, uh, Kyle tries to go to the top rope and hit a knee drop, but misses, and his he goes two knees first into the ladder. Now... Something most of you guys don't know about me is I have, in the most minor sense possible, I do have a a bad knee. I, I buggered it up while uh, while I was at a uh, at a music thing. I just landed on it funny, and the whole thing kind of twisted like this. Didn't break it. Didn't like need to do anything with it other than to just know that I had tore tore up. Uh, get the initials mixed up: the ACL, L, LCL, NCL, something like that. So every now and then. I'll, it'll just be a little bit uncomfortable. Every now and then, uh, you know, when the weather changes and whatnot, it gets a little bit stiff where I can't, you know, stand or sit in a uh, certain position for very long. That's just from me minorly being an idiot at, at a musical event. This guy came off the top rope and met the ladder with both fucking kneecaps. And I just, I cringe. I cringe. Because I'm a wuss. That's why I'm a fan, and that's why they're the wrestlers. Um... Kyle pulls Dunn down the ladder with an ankle lock, which was nice because he sort of does the dunk, 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 dunk down the ladders. Um, each man tosses a ladder in the other one's face. They trade some shots on the top. Dunn snaps the fingers. There's a lariat by Kyle. Chair shots by Dunn. Uh, first to the knee and then to the back. A bitter end on the guardrail looked really messy in the most effective way possible. Uh, Kyle tosses Dunn off the ladder into another ladder, and then a masked man comes along and tosses Kyle off the ladder so that Dunn can grab, uh, climb the ladder and grab the briefcase. Now, obviously, the heels were going to get the, uh, the War Games advantage because that's how the war games thing works. You constantly make it so that the baby faces are coming from behind. It tells a good story, Roddy Roddy Ra. Now, can you quickly name me a war games situation where the the baby faces were Undisputed Era? No, you can't. So as much as Undisputed Era has claimed this match as their match, they're going into it this time with the completely opposite dynamic, which makes it ten times more interesting. So they're in new territory, but not. And, and I'm not trying to oversimplify that, but it's the best of both worlds. You know what these guys can do in this situation, but yet you can still go in and be like, oh my God, what are these guys going to do in this situation? This is really cool because we've got an interesting, interesting, interesting card coming together here right now because you've got the triple threat for the North American Championship, which is going to be a lot of fun. You've got the strap match, which exists for reasons. We're going to have Ciampa and, and Thatcher. I want these guys to have some kind of match where they can destroy each other. There's not going to be a match for the women's title. There's not going to be a match for the tag titles. There's not going to be, as far as I know, unless unless somebody steps up next week, I don't think there's a match for the Cruiserweight Championship, but we still may have a challenger for... Balor. Now, I don't think whoever challenges Balor for the NXT Championship is going to win at War Games. I think it's going to be the same as as how we, you know, how we typically look at Royal Rumble uh, title matches. Because even though the title match could be great, the title match isn't the focus. The Rumble is the focus. In this case, you've got two War Games matches that are the that are the focus. If they're not going to feature a cruiserweight championship match. I wouldn't entirely... You guys tell me what you think down in the box below or hit it up in the chat over there. Would it be an interesting um, exhibition to have the NXT champion versus the NXT cruiserweight champion? 
I mean, Escobar has to lose that one. But, I mean, Escobar and Balor is definitely not a match we've seen before. You could definitely have the shenanigans with uh, Wilder Mendoza on the outside. Maybe somebody shows up to back up Balor. Maybe it's Kevin Owens. Maybe it's the returning Karrion Cross. Maybe Balor wins this match only to get dropped on his head after the match with the Doomsday Saido and set up whatever the the takeover is going into Royal Rumble or just after Royal Rumble or wherever the next pay-per-view is. I think whatever he does at this pay-per-view will be a setup for the next one. And that's not a bad thing because like I say, the main title, the main title is not the focus at War Games. War Games is the focus at War Games. But also... Balor's in a funky spot right now as well where he has, he's got a bit of a job to do because we've been saying, I've been saying, Jake's been saying, I, I know a couple of other people on, online have been saying, um, you know, don't hot shot the title again, even if Balor's injured, you know, he can afford to be out for a little while, we'll just let the women main event for a little while, we'll just let the North American Championship um, uh, main event for a while, we'll put the cruiserweights on a bigger stage, you know, we've got other things that we can focus on and we can just not have the champion on for a while if that's what needs to happen. But now that we've established that, Balor does have to come in as the champion and get everybody's attention again. Um, I like my idea of him facing Escobar. I don't think it's actually going to happen. I like my idea of him having a one-off with Kevin Owens. I don't think that's going to happen either. I don't think Karrion Cross is going to show up on the go-home show and say, yeah, by the way, we're fighting on Sunday. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know. People have said that it's going to be Kushida, and I wouldn't mind that either. Um, people were saying before this Thatcher thing came up that it was going to be Ciampa. I wouldn't mind that either. Uh, people are saying that it could be Velveteen Dream. And if they put Velveteen Dream in a title situation at War Games, even though, yes, like I just said, nobody who faces Balor at War Games is going to become the new champion because that's not the focus of the show. Uh, as far as being deserving of a spotlight where Velveteen Dream deserves absolutely none because he's a fucking diddler, um, you don't, you don't do it. And I'm going to treat it like I treated it the last time and the time before that. Uh, you guys can go back on this channel or if you're looking in a podcast form, you can look at, look, uh, at previous podcasts. There are two, uh, little snippets from, from commentaries that Jake and I have done, uh, examining the Velveteen Dream situation and examining the Velveteen Dream situation again. Um, I can't be any clearer about my thoughts on this that I already have. If you, if you put him and Balor at this point in the same ring at the same time ever, I don't think it can be understated what a bad message that is. And I don't... I try not to be somebody that comes off as, like, let me tell you what's morally right. I'll tell you what I think. I'll tell you why I feel the way I feel. But I, I will go on to say, if that is the case, that's really, that's bad. That's not just, I think that's bad. That's bad. Um, anybody else? Anybody else? Like, exhibition match with Swerve. Swerve's great. Like... Um, you want to bring somebody else if it's not going to be, if it's not going to be Owens, like Andrade is doing fuck all and he doesn't have a manager anymore, you know, because she decided to piss off the company. That's another conversation for another day. There's so much you can do with Balor because it's not the focus. I, I, that's why I've rambled on for the past three minutes about it. Um, but look at those two main events, man, like the Kings of NXT versus Undisputed Era and now Candice, Tony. Dakota, Raquel versus EO, Ripley, Ember, and Shotzi. Just saying. I will say one more time, if you if you take take my word for anything, go check out that uh, Lillian Garcia interview with Shotzi Blackheart. It may change your mind on a couple of things if you're not somebody that's exactly in her corner. Um, I don't really know. We're really, we're really getting close to war games and I'm very excited. I'm not popping off like I was last week because this was a little bit more functional. A couple of surprises. The, the Tony Storm heel turn is going to lead to a lot of fun things because we're going to get, we're going to get a rematch of that feud from NXT UK between her and Rhea Ripley, except the roles are reversed and it's going to be so fucking good. Um, 
Grizzled Young Veterans coming back can only do good things for that, that tag team division that most people think is non-existent. It's kind of like the AEW women's division. Oh, yes. Now that I've pissed off just about everybody, I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there, talk down there, start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I'll talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, tagging out, guys. Bye.